Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson. Well, here we are, seven years into the supposed recovery engineered by the Fed, and the only thing we can definitively say about the recovery is that the extremely wealthy got even wealthier, and the bottom quintiles got a little poorer. Further, we can note that the Fed is very, very late to the game of normalizing rates, as it's called, which means raising interest rates. But what does this mean? Is there really finally some relief for the long-suffering savers, the pensions, and those living on fixed incomes? Or are new risks involved that spring from all the massive market deformations the Fed has spawned over the past seven years? To help us make sense of this today is Dan Ammerman, a chartered financial analyst, author, and speaker with over 30 years of professional financial experience. As an investment banking vice president in the 1980s, he did work in security originations and asset liability management, including portfolio restructurings for financial institutions, as well as the creation of synthetic securities for institutional clients. So he's got decades of solid financial expertise, and he's been on the show before to discuss the concept of financial repression, an extremely important concept for you to understand. Dan, welcome back to the program. Well, thanks for having me back, Chris. Well, let's start here. Uh, The Fed rate decision, uh, we're recording this on Thursday. It happened yesterday on Wednesday, December 16th, 2015. Well, the Fed, it did not so much raise by a quarter percent as commonly presented in the media, uh, but raised the range of the Fed funds rate from existing between 0 and 0.25% to a new range of between 0.25 and 0.5%. Was this even really a rate hike? Oh, I would say that it was. We've seen an immediate reaction in the fixed income markets. We're seeing a a repricing in terms of particularly short-term treasuries Mm -hmm. uh, that's reflecting this. Uh, that is absolutely accurate. It's now a range. And we look at the effective Fed funds rate, <clears throat> which has basically been just barely above zero. So if they pull this off, and, and that's not quite clear at this point, um, it will probably move to 25, 30 basis points, uh, 0.25%, 0.30%, uh, something like that for the effective range. Now, would, would this um, actually be like prior of Fed tightening cycles where actual liquidity is drained from the market, or is the Fed going to use uh, new tools to try and get the, the rate to move, which would be less liquidity draining, such as, oh, just raising the rate uh, that they're going to pay on the overnight uh, money uh, for uh, or uh, the excess reserves that they're holding? Well, I think the key to understand here is that this is not normalizing, <clears throat> and we don't have a precedent. We really don't. Um, When I heard you say the words normalizing when you were introducing this, um, we're kind of all being soothed and reassured by the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg and Mm -hmm. financial authorities that we've been down this path before. We've been down it many times. More often than not, we've had rising markets as a result, and and really there's nothing to worry about. Um, The issue with that is there are many things this time that are entirely different. And what is presented as normalizing, for instance, is going back to, say, a projected interest rate cycle like we saw in the uh, 2000s or 1990s or something like that. Um, What's completely different, among many other things, is that we've never had rates forced so low before, and they've never been so low for so long. Um, So if you look, say, at a a long-term graph since 1954 um, of what's been going off the Fed funds rates, uh, we've had plenty of reversals in interest rate direction, but there have been these brief little dips that look nothing whatsoever like this. Uh, The other big issue, and this goes back to our prior conversation on financial repression and so forth, is that I don't think you can take any interest rate increases from the 2000s, 1990s, 1980s, 1970s as being comparable 
because we have the greatest degree of national debt outstanding that we've had since the 1940s and the 1950s. So you have to go much further back in time to see how a rate increase works when you have a country that's just absolutely massively in debt. And it's a very different process than these recent historicals are talking about. Well, let's let's talk about just how unusual all of this is, because I think that's an important backdrop for all of this story. So you're right. The Wall Street Journal is trying to soothe us and say, oh, this is a, a normal process. We've been down this road before. You mentioned there's additional outstanding uh, debt in the markets, but uh, government debt. But we've never had this degree of liquidity in the marketplace before. You know, two point five trillion in excess reserves parked at the Fed, with even more trillions out floating around in the wild. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. doing what it's doing in the markets with clear, clear signs of speculative excess in the markets. With I don't know, triple C junk debt uh, being getting down to a four handle at one point in two thousand fourteen, meaning a four uh, percent rate uh, in there. So that all feels very sort of extreme and excessive, but the Fed is trying to say, at least in every statement I've read, that this is all pretty normal and they don't detect any bubbles and everything looks reasonable and, and stocks are fairly priced, all of that. Uh, how would you? How do you view this? Um, I just read the statement from the Federal Reserve and what they clearly showed was this was not normal. And one of the clear ways that they showed it is that they um, made crystal clear that they would be keeping their current holdings of U.S. government and agency debt in roughly the the 2.4 to 2.5 trillion dollar range um, until this is fully confirmed. Uh, in in terms of they're sure they're going forward with the interest rate cycle and so forth. Now that by itself tells you this isn't normal. Uh, typically, if you're talking about driving interest rates down, you want liquidity in the system, you provide liquidity through asset purchases. If you want to drive interest rates up, you want to tighten the system and you might remove money from the system, let's say, by selling many of those assets. And they've made clear on the front end that they're not doing that. And I think this, again, ties very closely into what we've talked about before uh, with the um, size of the national debt with financial repression and so forth, uh, for financial repression to work, for the government to keep a lid on and control of interest rates, they need a large captive audience. One of the largest components of the captive audience is the federal funds currently holding such a large portion of the U.S. national debt. So if they were to follow a true normalizing cycle, they should be selling those, and they're not. Well, let's let's. I think this financial repression idea is, is critical to this. And uh, for the people who weren't here with us last time, who are listening new, can you briefly describe what financial repression means? Well, there's multiple components to it. If you want to take a, a big picture perspective, we have cycles going back and forth between markets and governments that have gone on for centuries. And these are typically described by economists as being cycles of liberalization and repression. That is, that they loosen up on the markets, they loosen up on the government controls. There's a massive creation of wealth. As often as not, after a few decades, there's some big bubbles that blow out or something. The financial system is in trouble. And then they go the opposite direction. They tighten. So that's kind of the big picture cycle that goes back and forth. And what I think many people are not aware of is that we had a reversal that occurred in the early 1970s where decades of repression was followed by liberalization and kind of everyone thought, well, that's the only alternative, that's the path forward from here. But we've had a complete 180-degree turn that occurred at roughly 2009, 2010, 2011. We're, we're back to a, a very classic case of governments increasing control over the markets. Now, the other more specific issue that people talk about with financial repression is the national debt. There's this fantastic sum that, that most of us can't really understand. How could we possibly be that badly in debt? How can we make the payments on that debt in terms of principal and interest and so forth? And people are right that if we were in a normal market situation, we would be in a huge degree of difficulty with the national debt. But again, this is something that's happened many times over the centuries. 
And what governments typically do, their most popular choice when they get deeply into debt, is they increase their control over the markets so they knock out the interest rate risk for themselves. Uh, they push rates way down, as they've done, to historic lows. And effectively, there's more to it than that, and we don't have – it's a, easily a full hour and more to talk about financial repression. But basically, they transfer wealth from savers to the government in the process of paying down the debt in a process that most people don't understand. Now, a, 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 a key component of that, of course, is you need to have negative interest rates in, in some way, shape, or form, nominal or real. We've never really – monkeyed around with negative nominal interest rates, but I guess they are in Europe. But but a negative interest rate meaning I've got my money, it, it's sitting in my bank account, it's earning zero, but inflation is still one and a half, two percent by the official statistics. So I'm actually and higher losing. than that, the real statistics, but yeah. Yeah. What what would you think the real number is? Uh I think we're at at least um four. I would agree. At Possibly the... higher. Four to five at least, maybe a little higher than that. Yeah, and, and, it's not any seven or ten percent like some people say. I don't think that's reality based, but it's certainly higher than the official rate, I would believe. Well, I, and I, I can I can justify a higher rate on, on just one piece, one component of the CPI for myself, which is uh, looking at the effect of Obamacare on on my insurance costs for health care, which includes a couple of components: rising premiums and and vastly increasing uh, deductible limits, which conspire together to to, to raise uh, the cost to me. And yeah, that's just fantastic. That by itself negates the CPI. I know in the CPI, they still weight uh, medical care in the CPI at 4.85% of total spend. But we can just open up our BEA GDP and notice that healthcare spending is uh, 18% of GDP. And, and so they've weighted it inappropriately. And of course they have, because if you included a full weighting, then the full burden of, of those increases would come roaring through. Um, and, and so I, I don't, for the life of me, I can't get anybody um, at, at the BLS to explain to me um, how it is that they, they weight uh, health care at just 4.8% uh, of, of, uh, of the CPI pie. It doesn't make any sense. So, well, they went to a black box in about 2002, 2003, if memory serves. They no longer fully disclose. Yeah. So, so, so at any rate, inflation's pretty high. And, uh, and a cornerstone of financial repression is that that purchasing power that I am losing on my savings getting zero while inflation is higher, that purchasing power that Wall Street Journal et al. would love to sort of, like it's a force of nature, your, your purchasing power, Chris, it just disappeared. But your point, I believe, is it doesn't just disappear, it's getting transferred. And an important recipient of that would be the government. Is that correct? Yes, it's an entirely deliberate process, and there's nothing really controversial about it when it comes to professional economists. You know, this concept has been around for a very long time. Uh, the name financial repression itself only dates to the 1970s, but this is a matter of national policy for the United States, for the United Kingdom, for Australia, for Canada, uh, for basically the developed world in the aftermath of World War II. It's, it's a very well understood process. Now, the other thing to keep in mind about it is it's highly effective when we have near zero interest rates, but you don't need near zero interest rates. It also works fine at 1%, at 2%, at 2.5%, so long as the rate of inflation is higher. Great. So, so it, it, you know, the Fed has been saying for a long time they, they would love to see higher inflation. They never really explain why that's going to be good for um, the average person, they just talk about it as if everybody uh, has this prima facie understanding, of course. Of course, higher inflation is what we all need. Um, and what you're saying is that higher inflation is not needed by you or myself necessarily, but it is kind of needed by the system. Uh, I think that's a very good way of phrasing it, yes. Okay. The, the, the theory is that you promote full employment by having a, a low rate of inflation. I think that's very weak in terms of any case there. But in terms of government tax revenues, in terms of governments dealing with things like large levels of debt, yes, they have a huge incentive to have an ongoing rate of inflation. Now, what we've seen, of course, and, and I think that the absolute confirmation uh, that anybody would need that financial repression is, is the active program of study is so Europe's now slipped into negative nominal interest rates. And of course, it took about a month for that after that for them to start talking about bans on cash. Explain why that would be. Well, if you have cash, 
um, you're not really necessarily losing value. Mm -hmm. And the key to financial repression is that it's not so much that you create a, a negative differential, but everyone has to be forced to participate uh, through a combination of carrots and sticks. And if people are holding on to their cash, then they're not getting the negative interest rate, so they're not participating. So there's this, this corralling function, this everybody has to be forced to participate. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the more solid pieces of statistics I have going back is, the, um, is that uh, negative inter real interest rates and positive gold prices, uh, very good correlation, but that's broken down pretty badly. Um, in, in the last several years. Uh, and so uh, is in your mind, how does gold fit into this picture right now? Gold is a classic element of financial repression. Um, and so is silver. The, um, the issue is that people, if you are forcing a negative yield on them, uh, they want to get out of that. And, and they want an asset that will keep up with inflation. So typically what they will do is uh, many people try to move to gold and silver and dodge financial repression by doing so. And if you want to know why um, uh, it was illegal in the United States and as well as the United Kingdom and so forth to own gold for investment purposes um, between 1933 and the mid-1970s, that's exactly the case because it allowed you to potentially escape financial repression. All right. Well, it, it certainly seems to be the case. And, of course, uh, I have another chart here that shows that during the weeks of the FOMC decisions, gold does particularly horrendously. Um, so, so there's, uh, at any rate, whether the market's been trained to behave a certain way or, or whatever's been going on, it's been very difficult to make sense of uh, the degree of financial excess that exists out there and the behavior of certain certain assets. Um, but but so Dan, here we are. You know, when I'm looking at this, I, I want I, the the question I have is how trapped is the Fed here? And 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 the way I'm going to sort of uh, build out that question for you is to note that you know they've put all this money in. They've they they and other central banks in combination have created conditions which have seen at, at least uh, an increase of nearly $60 trillion of new debt created since the 2007 crisis began. Um, and uh, they've created all that debt with this explicit, implicit understanding that that debt could be justified, rationalized, and supported if we got back to fast economic growth or at least reasonable trend-like growth. We're not seeing that across the world. And worse, when I look into the commodity world, I see uh, very, very clear signs of deflation. Uh, it looks to me like the Fed is really scared of that deflationary impulse, so they're just doing everything they can to keep financial assets elevated, but commodities really seem to be slipping out the back door and saying, no, we're, we're in the depths of a, of a pretty major deflationary wave. So let me get back to that. How, how trapped is the Fed here at this point? Oh, they're completely trapped. And uh, if you look at the speeches they make to fellow economists, uh, they acknowledge that. And I've written a, a huge amount uh, on various aspects of this and then have a number of articles at my website. Um, but the kind of the heart of the dilemma, and, and there's many different aspects to this, is that the Federal Reserve essentially attempted to create a cocoon of sorts to keep the damage from getting too much worse um, from the uh, financial crisis of 2008. And they did this by just flooding the system with a very low cost new cash. And what that did was that reversed the downward trend that was occurring at the time in asset prices. And quite predictably, and again, this, this is absolutely accepted economics. There's nothing controversial about it. Uh, the attempt of what they're attempting to do here is something called the wealth effect. And the idea with the wealth effect is that um, people watch patterns. And that's what makes us feel good or bad. You know, if we have the pattern going upwards, then we feel good, and maybe we change our financial behavior. If the pattern is going downwards, we feel bad, and we don't spend money, and we don't take financial risks, and then this becomes self-reinforcing. So what the Fed was very intentionally attempting to do with the wealth effect 
is that by flooding the market with cheap cash, asset prices would rise, everybody would feel better about where they are, they'd feel better about their savings, they'd feel better about their retirement, and they would go out and spend money in the real economy, as well as saving additional money. Um, but the risk is, if you push up asset prices and the economy doesn't respond, all you've done is you've created a massive bubble that's absolutely dependent on very low yields. And the other issue that you run into is that the Federal Reserve has very effectively trained, particularly institutional investors, um, that kind of bad news is good news. And this has been true for a number of years now. Uh, the institutional investors of the world don't really worry about bad economic indicators. Instead, as, as I know you've seen, Chris, for some years now, every time we have a bad result, markets rise. Mm -hmm. And the reason that happens is that the um, Federal Reserve has essentially trained the institutional investors of the world that, look, we have the trillions of dollars. We can control uh, asset prices or at least strongly influence them. And any time what would ordinarily be bad news that would cause the markets to drop, that just lets the investors know we're going to take more aggressive action to keep the markets from dropping. So you have this kind of reverse differential there. Now, the problem is, and they've known about this from the beginning, that they don't really know how to do this. If you have elevated asset prices that are artificially high, and they're based on investors being essentially trained that the Fed's going to override the market. There's a so-called Fed put. You know, people have been talking about for years where they've always got your back. They'll come back in and they'll, do, they'll help you out and so forth. How do you handle that transition from overpriced markets where investors are counting on Federal Reserve interventions to reality-based markets where the investors aren't counting on the Fed? How do you do that without triggering a rush for the exits at some point? Well, that's part of the grand experiment we've got going on right now. Not just a grand experiment, I, I would suggest, but but you know, I think that uh, you know, full disclosure, my, my grandfather is a banker. Um, he's, he's he passed away a while ago, and he served on the New York Federal Reserve under Volcker for a period in the '70s. And I don't think he would recognize anything about what's happening at this point. Something went off the rails. I, I, I actually peg all this around 94, 95. There was a little hiccup in the corporate bond markets, and, and Greenspan responded by doing this crazy experiment, which is known as the sweep accounts, which basically were um, complicated too much. I won't go into it here, but it removed the reserve requirement for banks so they could flood the, the world with money, and, and, and they fixed the corporate bond market. But they also ignited uh, the dot-com craze because it was all this money just like going crazy all over the world. Uh, and that, of course, created a crash. And then we had a response to that, which created an even larger bubble and crash. And here we are in the third incarnation of this, which you know the Fed's gone even further down this path, taking us to zero and holding us there, not just for a little while, not for five or six months, but going on six years now. Uh, so so that's that's just an astonishing sort of a pattern, but it's a highly interventionist pattern. And if I had to characterize it, I, I think I think Greenspan and then Bernanke echoed this sentiment, which was, well, even if we do foster bubbles, um, you know, they burst and then and then at least we're there to help clean up the mess. So so I think the Fed's in this pattern of everybody loves the party they throw and they create this big bubble and then they get to ride to the rescue by performing heroic things that allow you to write a book like Bernanke's title, which was The Courage to Act. You know, it's kind of like that. That's like a, a drunk driver uh, jumping out with a medical kit and having the courage to, to help, uh, uh, you know, the, the people that he just injured uh, in, in by plowing into them. Uh, that's how I see it. But of course, the Fed sees it differently. They, they do think they're doing uh, some very heroic sorts of, of things here. But this bubble that they've created here, the, Dan, I'd love to get your, your impression of this. This one isn't just in the U.S. housing market. This one's kind of worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even know where you could go to hide from this one if it bursts. Uh, you know, do you see this as being global or is this more localized and just in a few markets? Oh, this is scary, Chris. Our minds were working alike there. Um, as you were talking, you know, I was thinking because I also identified basically the mid-1990s 
as being when a major turning point occurred. And it really happened in three different areas simultaneously. And these are all important for what's going on this year, what's going to happen next year, and so forth. Uh, one of them was the central bank economists deciding they're geniuses and they can overwrite the um, ordinary business cycle um, through essentially creating, flooding the system with large amounts of cheap cash. And every time they've done it, they've created a bubble, but they're not really reality-based at this point. They're not fully accepting that. There was a second part that was equally important. And uh, I would say the mid-90s were the time when the, um, much of the U.S. domestic economy really started to implode, and we moved to a much more internationalized world, where in terms of um, employment, it, it became a much more international system. If we look at flows of capital, they became far more international at the same time. And the third component, and this also very tightly ties into the Federal Reserve, is they are the regulator of the banking system. Mm -hmm. And it was in the mid-90s when we really let the regulations go. We used to have a very strict regulatory structure for institutions that offered federally insured deposits. You know, if, if you did not have any government backing whatsoever, you could go take whatever risk you wanted to as a true capitalist. But we had rigid restrictions on the banks that relied upon effectively the guarantee of the U.S. government in terms of what they could do. And those were also released in the 1990s. And we have all three of those kind of wrapping around today, and, and this is where things get just fascinating as, as well as scary, is that we've never been through a situation like this in an international world that is so tightly interlocked. And a big part of this then comes down to what is uh, referred to as the divergence, which is U.S. interest rates rising while they remain very low in Japan and they remain effectively negative in Europe. Mm -hmm. Because what that, then, what that then does is that ties everything in with our jobs as well as our financial security. Because the, um, the this has been, of course, discussed a very great deal, but what we would expect with a divergence, and we've seen this, uh, of course, over the last 78 years on a global scale, when we had the divergence going the other direction, when the U.S. had lower rates than did emerging markets around the world, um, that pumped huge sums of cash into the emerging markets, their uh, currencies appreciated, their asset markets appreciated, and so forth. But, but the problem that we're looking at, and the Fed actually acknowledged this, they didn't really discuss it, they acknowledged it in their statement from yesterday, is that we're having problems with um, employment because of our currency. Mm -hmm. And corporations are running this in the U.S. right now, too. So a side effect of our increasing rates when the rest of the world isn't, is that all else being equal, the U.S. dollar should strongly climb over time, and if that does happen, then the American worker is at an ever bigger disadvantage compared to workers in other nations, and the worse our employment prospects become, even as spending reduces and the economy does worse. And this was an international component uh, that your grandfather wouldn't have recognized. It's so much more prevalent now. Indeed, and, and uh, I, I think a lot of that dynamic has, has become enshrined in some of the recent trade agreements. I don't profess to understand them, all many tens of thousands of pages of them, but what little I've seen in the summaries, uh, it, I don't understand how, how this is all supposed to work um, from a national standpoint. I, I think from a global standpoint, I get it. And from a global international corporation standpoint, I get it. But from a national standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me anymore. It doesn't, but the, and, and the fascinating part is they don't let it slow them down, though. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, they know perfectly well they don't have a solution for this. Uh, we are, some people would say, in an effective state of currency warfare already. And we know perfectly well that a really big difference between the long-term history of U.S. interest rate increases and what we're seeing right now is the very sudden and dramatic effect on United States employment and corporate profits if the U.S. dollar climbs too high. Mm -hmm. We're exposing ourselves to, to major employment and economic risk but we don't know what to do about that. There is no solution. Uh, there, there is no magic ring that the economists know about. But yet we proceed anyway because so many people, a small minority of the overall population, 
but so many connected inside it are making so much money with this increasing globalization. Yes, yes. So, so that's certainly the trend, and these long trends have been in play for a while. And so what I'd like to do is, is maybe dial this back, and, and uh, uh, let's think about the, the average person. They've got a 401k, maybe they've got some savers, maybe they're in a pension, uh, maybe they're trying to figure out if they should, um, when they should retire and, and begin taking Social Security. Uh, how would you even begin to advise people um, with those sorts of considerations here at this point in time? I mean, is there really anything anyone can do to protect themselves from from a government and a system that has boxed itself in that has no um, has no mathematically um, certain end game besides ruin at some point? If I could put it, you know, in a in a short term, but but there really doesn't feel like there's a way out of the box that we're in that that has a, a positive outcome, and yet everybody still has to play the game because we're trapped within it. Put those two pieces together if you can. I would. Lo- I'm. I'm you know, just. I'm. I'm really struggling with with how to play this at this point. Well, this has been a focus of mine for many years, and um, what I have become convinced of is that so long as we play the game the way that we're supposed to, mm-hmm. then environments like this, there's no way out other than luck. Um, or perhaps being so fortunate as to um, be in one of the, in the position of the minority of the population that is just financially thriving in these circumstances, the, the quote unquote one percent and so forth. But when you have <clears throat> the government overriding markets to essentially move wealth from savers to the government and from the favored financial institutions on a deliberate basis in a manner that the general population does not understand and the media isn't really covering, I don't know the way out. The, I would, I would say the starting point though is education, Mm -hmm. which is what each of us provide education, trying to help people understand what's going on. If you don't understand the problems, I don't think there's any way of coming up with a solution. Right, And the um, uh, other approach that I take, and this goes back to my background ever since I got out of graduate school, and, and you talked about a little bit of that earlier on, is that I used to structure synthetic securities and other things like that. And if you look at things from a more, I don't know, a little more upper level or high tech perspective, uh, in finance, uh, there is no such thing as um, a necessary loss. Rather, you always have two sides of an equation. You have a winner and you have a loser. And if the government intervenes in the markets so that following the traditional retirement investment path is going to cause losses, then it is highly unlikely that you're going to find a way out of that unless you can find a way to reverse your financial prof- uh, profile such that you're benefiting from what the government's doing. So give us an example. How, how one, is there any one example we can point to? Um, well, uh, one alternative is to benefit from low interest rates. And that would be to try to do um, what many financial institutions do, what all financial institutions do, which is they basically create a differential between a a very low cost of funds and then an asset they purchase with that that produces a cash flow. Mm -hmm. Now, individuals can't do this the same way that financial institutions do. I would never recommend that. That would be far too risky. Uh, But there are risk-reduced methods for doing so. I'm a big fan of of uh, using low interest rates to to, to uh, accumulate cash flowing assets. Of course, you know that's uh, that's not easy, um, and and of course it's not as easy as clicking a mouse button on my E Trade account and getting a few shares of IBM or whatever. Uh, but uh, but it's it's certainly it's the only way I have personally determined uh, how to deploy my capital at this point is is actively doing the due diligence, investigating uh, uh, cash flowing enterprises. I understand typically much smaller ones. These would be called the small of the small medium enterprises, and and figuring that out because I I really can't 
make sense of the game anymore. And so you're talking, Dan, to somebody who's quite jaded. I watch the markets extremely closely. I, I've mm -hmm. seen how the market structure has changed um, to the advantage of the co-located high-frequency trading computers. I see how the algorithms play markets. I watch um, mm -hmm. these uh, thinly traded uh, assets, including gold, but other ones as well, get slammed in the thinnest of moments by what are clearly price um, manipulating movements, both up and down. Uh, the SEC couldn't care less. And, and so I look at all that and I can only conclude, I don't know how to play the trading game anymore. So can I? is there a way to invest in this market? And the answer in many cases is no, because I don't understand Amazon with a price earning multiple of 940. I don't get it. Um, and so I'm left with uh, trying to take control of my money as much as I can. But that's much harder work, of course, to um, really roll your sleeves up and, and understand a business uh, from the more granular level. Is, is Would that be an example of what you're talking about? That's no coincidence. Uh, that's the point. Um, the system, I would argue, is uh, effectively predator and prey. And uh, the rules are written in such a way that um, when you invest, uh, most of the benefits from that investment or all of the benefits from that investment uh, pass through to other parties. Uh, that can be the case for decades at a time. Um, and the easier you make it to invest, the more money that flows uh, to those other parties. Now, a key part of, um, you know, I think back to when I was in the investment industry in, in the early 1980s and IRAs were really exploding. And the way they were referred to uh, around the office was IRAs were the Brokers Full Employment Act. Hmm. Cynical people. Yep. But, but the point of the matter was never, if you look at the enabling IRA legislation, I would argue that someone who has worked in the investment industry would understand just fine that every year those funds are outstanding. The, the financial industry earns money off that account where all we do is we have paper profits that the investor can't touch over that entire period. And they don't necessarily care what happens to the retirement investor, I hate to say this, mm -hmm. 30 or 40 years out. What they care about is the fee income they make during that entire period. So then it gets set up where it is uh, very easy indeed to invest money so long as the real benefits from a lot of that money is going to go to other people. And I think we're seeing the next stage in that evolution right now where the government is really pushing companies and it's increasingly becoming the case where you, when you begin employment, you are by default entered into a retirement program. You have to actually contact human resources and go through a hassle to get out of that. Otherwise, supposedly for your own good, you have an immediate deduction that goes straight into the financial markets. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and uh, all we have to do is look at the uh, bonus pool every year to understand that money's flowing out of those markets all the time into Wall Street pockets. Somehow, didn't they didn't magically create that money out of themselves out of thin air? It came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's an important thing that I had to learn uh, over time, Dan, is that is that trading's a zero-sum game. There's a winner, there's a loser. And this particularly applies to the whole concept of derivatives. I know a lot of people, and I know you're, you, you know a lot about them, actually, somebody who, who designed structured products. So um, a lot of fear, uncertainty around derivatives, I think rightly so. But but maybe inappropriately in some cases where people see the notional value and it's in the multiple trillion, hundreds of trillions of dollars and... and um, uh, mm -hmm. But the key thing is that it's it, a derivative is just a bet, right? It's a bet between two parties. One wins, one loses. I would I would love so uh, the so-called city amendment uh, to uh, it was tucked into a spending bill, which which uh, enshrined the idea that um, derivative bets between banks would be considered um, secured uh, secured loans, as it were, meaning that you, the depositor, with your unsecured account would be somewhere back of derivatives should there be um, an event that causes that bank to get into trouble. Uh, this is the bail-in procedures we're talking about. I'm wondering, have you studied those, and, 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 and do you um, have a view on that? Well, I've, I've looked at bail-ins um, extensively, and of course they are now a matter of law in the United States, as well as Europe as elsewhere. And it is fascinating that you would think it would be just the reverse. I mean, that's kind of the idea that bail-ins were sold under, is that the big institutional investors took their hits first, yeah. 
and um, the small depositor took their hits last. And what we're seeing is an inversion. You know, in, in many cases there where that's happening. And um, the in terms of the notional value, this is one of those fascinating things. Okay, uh, for instance, if you look at uh, interest rate derivatives, which are, are very topical for what we're talking about today, um, there's approximately, and the number's been falling lately, but approximately 500 trillion outstanding, which is about 400 times the size of the subprime mortgage market mm -hmm. that helped trigger the financial crisis of 2008. So we have a huge amount of risk there. But the um, uh, the flip side of, of that is, is that uh, people are told, well, financially educated people understand that that's not actually $500 trillion in risk. What it is that Bank A entered into a contract with Bank B, that they entered into a contract with Bank C, that entered into a contract with Bank D, and the reason, so they're just kind of passing that risk around and they're chopping it up in little bits, and they're each taking little pieces, and then they look at that, and they run their spreadsheets, and they all agree they're geniuses, and they get great big whopping bonuses. Well, you know, essentially the banks are then at risk in terms of the amount of derivatives outstanding. But the problem is, and this is one of those situations where there's a basic contradiction in how things are explained to the general public, is that when we collapse the exposure of the system, down by all those contracts, what we're accepting is what brought things down in 2008, which is counterparty risk. Each time you do that, when bank A goes to bank B, goes to bank C, goes to bank D, goes to bank E, and so forth, every time you do that, you say, okay, we knocked out our risk because that other bank is taking most of the risk for us, unless they're not good for the risk. And then you have what the International Monetary Fund refers to as counterparty risk, which can run through the system and knock everything down. And once you understand that, then you see the priority for derivatives, and then you see why they are moving to uh, clearing houses on an international basis as well. Now, I um, uh, for for me, you know, I think Greenspan got this badly wrong. He he, he noted that he loved derivatives because they seem to. Um, make risk disappear. I, I think that we need to understand that there's a law like like the law of thermodynamics that states energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only transformed. I, I think there needs to be a law of risk, which applies to derivatives, which is that risk can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transferred. Would you agree that, that the derivatives have, have helped us um, mask the risk, but they haven't eliminated the risk? And, and therefore it's allowed actually more risk to accumulate in the system rather than less. Let me comment on that on a couple of levels. Um, first, um, in the industry, um, one of the oldest of all games is hedging. Okay? If hedging is done properly, it leads to a reduction in risk. And the idea with hedging is that you take an asset that has an exposure to something. It could be price risk. It could be funding risk or whatever. And you go enter into a contract or do something else on the other side of it that has an exposure in the opposite direction. Okay. So when you put the two together, the risk drops out and you're left with return. That's the theory. Okay. That's really, really hard to do in practice. Um, institutions have a great deal of trouble at it. So what almost always ends up happening is what's called active timing, where they call it a hedge for regulatory purposes, but they're actually just taking a massive risk. And of course, we've seen that in the headlines again and again and again with derivatives traders as well as other traders. They're supposedly hedging risk, and instead they're doubling down on the risk and taking as much as possible under the pretense of reducing risk. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and they get a personal gain for that. You know, they not make an extra 10 or $20 million, an enormous sum for an individual, but the downside is they may lose their institution, the taxpayers, you know, 10 billion or, or 20 billion if it goes the wrong direction. And the other core here that we're looking at with derivatives is that we have um, what is called correlated risk. 
which is, okay, I'm a financial geek. It's, it's interesting stuff. But the deal is that typically, and this is the way Greenspan viewed it, um, you could look at derivatives as being an insurance contract. Okay, And let's mm-hmm. say you are a fire insurance company, and you have policies written in many neighborhoods in California and New York and Texas. Okay, And, and the idea is maybe a house will burn down in California, but there's no correlation with a house burning out in Texas. Mm-hmm. And a house may burn down in New York, but there's no correlation mm-hmm. with a house burning down in Illinois. So it, it's it's there's no correlation there. And you just take your money in from writing the insurance policies. You pay out your statistically predictable amount you're going to pay out, and you make money. Now, what really collapsed the subprime market, which was the trigger, it wasn't the only thing involved, but the, the trigger for what happened in 2008 was they ran into correlated risk. Uh, the investment banks had been making the same crazy bets on a nationwide basis when it came to subprime lending standards in California, New York, Texas, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, simultaneously. And when things turned negative, they turned negative for the entire nation simultaneously, mm-hmm. like one fire going across the other, the, the entire country at the same time. And what, what, the moment that happened, they blew through their reserves instantly. They could not possibly handle correlation. And, and that was the problem with how Greenspan looked at it. And this is where the risks really get interesting with um, what's going on with interest rates, even with this very tiny little gradual, I don't think it'll do it by itself by any means, uh, one quarter of 1% increase, is um, interest rates are, by definition, correlated risk. It's, it's not like interest rates just go up for this one contract that you're looking at. They go up for everyone simultaneously. And everyone can, on a micro level, have these um, interwoven contracts between the banks saying, we are protected here, we're protected here, we're protected here. But we have above that this macro level of where does the financial industry as a whole come up with the capital to make the interest uh, payments if they rise for the nation as a whole. Now, we've been seeing that a little bit, I think, looking at the high-yield market, uh, high-yield credit would this be an example where if somebody's written credit default swaps and they've been writing them out uh, across uh, that universe, you would say that um, there's a degree of correlation with, within that submarket so that if, if high yield credit begins to um, get distressed and the yields are rising and maybe defaults are beginning to rise, that, that it's not an uncorrelated event that junkie company A and junkie company B are experiencing distress at the same time. Yes, if you want to know why the massive intervention occurred in the fall of 2008, uh, that was exactly why. And the uh, credit default swaps, which are a much less important part of the market now than they used to be, um, were what was really going on. Uh, I mean, people talk about Lehman, but it was actually Fannie and Freddie that nearly destroyed Wall Street until they were taken over in the early days of September. Because if they had gone under, they would have triggered the credit default swaps, and basically all of Wall Street would have been destroyed in a matter of days. Um, and that risk is still there, now, although, again, the, the credit default market is not nearly as important as it used to be. Okay. So, I think so interest rates are where the heart of the, the trouble is right now. All right. So let's talk about interest rates for a bit, and let me get back to where we started, which is, so the Fed just hiked rates, at, well, they hiked the range. Um, do you think they're going to continue to hike at this point? And uh, if so, what, is that, what does that imply to this uh, risk, this interest rate risk that, that you're talking about? I think they very explicitly don't have the slightest idea. Okay. <laughs> this whole thing is an experiment. They, they really don't know how to do this. And that is why they are taking a much slower approach um, than they were before. And they're being very tentative about that. It used to be that in a, uh, a tightening cycle, an interest rate rising cycle, that um, if you were, you might be looking at raising rates, say, 2.5% over the course of a year. 
they're now talking about one and a quarter percent may be contingent on, again, if you look at the statement, multiple different risk factors. Well, they said, uh, uh, you know, that this is they're, they're on a path to raising, but that the path might is dependent on whatever happens next. So theoretically, the path could go back into a negative slope instead of a positive slope. I mean, they, they yeah. very explicitly said, hey, we, we, we don't know. We're on a path, but the path could change direction, right? So. It's a, a three-year path of very gradual increases where they have uh, caveats built into it on multiple different levels. Um, they really don't know. They haven't done this before. Hmm. Okay. No matter how many times you read in some places that, okay, this has been done many times before, nothing quite like this has ever been done before. So in, 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 uh, in your mind, what would cause the Fed to reverse course and, uh, and drop us back down to zero? Um, I think the number one risk that they're looking at is if one of the multiple markets that are dependent on very cheap rates starts to move quickly against them. Okay? We're already in a situation where many people are expecting a recession to occur in 2016 or 2017. We have highly elevated asset prices, and the biggest issue of all is, and uh, uh, many of the uh, leading economists around the world, the leading institutions have been warning of this, we have a particular uh, liquidity danger at the moment uh, in terms of everyone heading for the exit at the same time, and there not being anyone to buy them on the other side. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we saw a small example of that with some ETFs back in August. Um, the market just disappeared. And with the bond funds that had to gate uh, redemptions recently. Yeah, and if you're looking at the um, the high yield, uh, that's a, again, that's a very um, a correlated factor there because people were, they bid them down to these incredibly low, insane levels because they couldn't get yield anywhere else. And if you can get yield somewhere else, um, and you don't need them so desperately, then logically, people head for the exits. And as soon as they head for the exits, prices start to fall. And then this creates the, the classic liquidity, liquidity crunch scenario that's at the heart of, of most financial crises historically, is everyone looks around and they see everyone else heading for the exits. So they go to, there's very limited amount of money to buy them out, you have a crash, and then you're in a very bad situation again. And in my mind, the most likely source for the Federal Reserve um, reversing course is to see that happen um, in a real-time basis in a major market over the coming months. Okay. Could be so, high yield. So let's. Pre I, I think there's a high chance of that happening. Let's pretend it has happened. I don't think dropping from the current range back to zero to 0.25 does much besides a, a little temporary boost to the market psychology, maybe it, you know, if they could walk down expectations that they're no longer going to do any raising in the future, that'll have a, a, a sort of a lowish effect. I've seen all the trial balloons. I'd love to get your opinion on these as, in the final question set here, which is uh, we've seen them talk about, oh, um, giving a little bit of money to everybody, a la Finland. We have uh, St uh, Steve Keen's um, idea of giving a big $50,000 per household debt jubilee uh, sort of a payment out there. We've seen negative interest rates being floated with uh, a ban on cash. Uh, and then um, other ideas were maybe uh, more fiscal stimulus with a, a overt uh, monetization of that debt, which might take the form of, I don't know, a tax holiday uh, that everybody gets to participate in with the Fed monetizing the debt. Amongst those range of options, do you think one or more of those will be tried in the future? Is that what's coming next? Um, they very well could be, but I think the more likely thing is that they will continue to go back to what they have been doing for many years now, which is basically set up the playing field in a way that works for them and accomplish what they want to accomplish in a politically deceptive manner. Um, that's why we have financial repression. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have four basic ways, and we've seen this through history, of dealing with very large national debts. You can have austerity, which is politically very unpopular. You can have high rates of inflation, which people understand is politically very unpopular. You can have default, 
which people understand is politically very unpopular, or you have option number four behind door number four, which is financial repression, which nobody understands. And because it's not understood, they don't have the political price for doing it. And I, w- I would, it's, it's possible they will do some of these very large overt things, uh, but more likely is that they would double down on what's already working for them. I guess my question is, but is it really working? It feels it feels a little Japan-like at this point, where it works if and only if they can get the rates of inflation and economic growth, so that um, you know they can loop all of those uh, uh, pilfered um, purchasing power units back through you know uh, door number four. But but that's not what is, working. But, but, but wait, but okay, we, we got a real basic question here that I think is very important. What does working mean? Does that mean solving a problem or staying in power? Mm. Well, that's a good point. Well, uh, I, 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 don't... I, I assume it means, though, that, that, that you know, there's this deflationary wave building, which, which I think has the chance of, of be, being like austerity. I mean, it's a, it's a thing that if it takes hold mm-hmm. and really you know, sweeps across the landscape, I think that uh, that would be very politically unpopular, and I think it could sweep people out of power if it comes to pass. Mm-hmm. And then at that point, you are looking at um, uh, that's what you're talking about in terms of the Finland example, in terms of uh, just creating large sums of cash and sending it out to people, much like uh, Bush was doing, let's say in 2007 on a smaller scale here in the United States. Um, that could certainly work, but the um, I don't want to be cynical here, but um, Typically, when they have, if you do that for the population as a whole, then everyone benefits equally. But if you instead create $2.4 trillion in cash and you put it out through the Federal Reserve to the banking system, then most of the population does not benefit. Connected insiders do benefit, and nobody really understands where the money is coming from. So again, not to be too cynical, but there's there's two levels there that, that, that I might disagree with you on. Number one, working is not solving a problem. Working is staying in power where you can keep the flow of money going to yourself and to your friends. And number two, knowing that this is the case, a screening mechanism that's going to be used for if, let's say, extreme survival techniques are are necessary to be deployed by the central bank or by the financial system, um, they're going to try to do these in a way that uh, sends ever more wealth to a concentrated group of people. And I don't see how that works if they send everyone, you know, $10,000 simultaneously or whatever. Right. No, no, I, yeah, I totally understand that. And, um, uh, you know, I've got a uh, a quick quote for you from Bernanke. Uh, he's talking with Martin Wolf of the Financial Times, and, and, and uh, so Martin's a smart guy, but he just let this statement go where Bernanke said, quote, it's ironic that the same people who criticize the Fed for helping the rich also criticize the Fed for hurting savers. And those two things are inconsistent. Um, I I'm, guess I'm not a smart guy because I, I actually think those two things are entirely consistent, and it fits mm-hmm. in with what you're saying is that uh, he Bernanke is in such a position he feels like he can say that outright that we haven't really been helping the uh, the rich and we haven't really been hurting the poor and, and those two things you know you can't really pin those on us but of course as we've just discussed over the past 58 minutes here th- that's exactly what the Fed has been doing and on purpose absolutely absolutely they, they've basically been uh, redistributing wealth from savers to the federal government and to people who understand asset liability management right Well, with that, uh, we are out of time. I could keep going with you forever and ever. We'll have to do this again soon because there's so much more I didn't get to. I've got many questions still here. I can't wait to get those. Uh, So, Dan, tell us how people can follow you and your excellent work. Uh, My website is danielammerman.com, and I've got just the whole cluster of articles there about the national debt, uh, how that relates to what's going on with investors, what that does for retirement, uh, impacts on Social Security, possibility of crisis, all those different issues. And if uh, people are interested, I also have a free book they can sign up for. 
And I find this works best to kind of deliver it over time because this is a, a genuine process of paradigm change. It will kind of step by step take them through a better understanding of, of looking at this deeply unfair situation and finding where the opportunities can be, but in a very non-conventional manner. Well, I want to thank you for both the education and and the uh, and the advice that that you're helping to deliver to people because this is a highly unconventional time, and I think it does begin, of course, with understanding. You have to understand the system as it is, and of course, the system may well change in us as we go forward. Uh, it so you very have... easily could. Well, I sure enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for your time today. Thank you, Chris.